Good evening and welcome to Poetry at the Dali. As Helen Wallace told me uh, or remarked, you're all missing us since last spring. And, and, and you're back in force. We're really happy about that. Thanks for being with us. I'm really pleased to see in the audience uh, one of our trustees, Lorna Taylor. Lorna, thanks for being with us. Uh, we have tonight, and we've had his faithful attendance, which we're really gratified with Peter Mankey, the Poet Laureate of the State of Florida. And his creative partner, Jeannie, and his, may I say, conjugal partner also. Uh, it works really well together, the two. So thank you for uh, supporting this this evening. Um, we have two great poets tonight, Danny Lawless and Jay Hopler, and we're going to begin in our traditional way, which is to ask Helen Pruitt Wallace, Poet Laureate of St. Petersburg, to read a poem and introduce tonight's readers. Helen. Thank you, Hank. And, um, and you know what? We have to start this season. We're going on our third season. That's pretty good, right? Um, I want to thank the Dolly Museum for supporting this program. Um, you know, it's been terrific. And, and so many people who work here at the museum have helped with this. John, Dennis back in the AV, Sarah Fornov, Allison Cruz. We couldn't do it without all the many folks here who help us, and especially um, Hank Hind, a fine a fine poet in his own right. Um, and he's just being a little too modest about our getting him up here enough. But, um, and we have to do a big shout out for AARP, who is sponsoring us again this year. Thank you. As well as the city of St. Petersburg. Thank you um, for doing this. And it is really great to see everybody out tonight. Um, wow, Elaine, back from Romania. <laughs> and, huh? Um, yeah, so it's, it's fun to see everybody here. Thank you for coming. Um, super excited about starting uh, this season off again. We've got a great lineup, and uh, we'll talk about that more as the season goes on, but I think you'll be pleased. We have a lot of interesting um, poets who will be reading for us, and especially two terrific poets tonight to kick off um, our event. Um, so, so I will read one short poem. Thank you, Hank. <laughs> Um, and, and I chose this poem that this, this season, our theme, we always have a theme for every season, and we tell our poets, you know, please interpret it as metaphorically as you want um, and address it by the poems that you choose, or, or if you prefer not to, that's okay too. We never want to tie anybody's hands about what they choose to read. Um, but this season, because we have the Magritte um, exhibit coming up, uh, this season the theme is things are not as they seem. And you know what, I've kind of, the more I think about it, the more I think, God, pretty much everything you write about has got to be, you know, <laughs> it's got to be about that, right? Um, so anyway, I'm going to read a short poem. And this poem also, I don't know, it has a few lines in it that, um, that I think are also sort of relative to what's going on in the Carolinas right now. And some of you may have friends and family that way, and we certainly all wish them the best. Um, the title of this poem is Considering the Unreliable Narrator at Fort DeSoto Beach. And it has an epigraph um, by Simone Vale. Um, she was a philosopher, a mystic, a political activist who lived in the early 20th century. And the epigraph goes like this. I also am other than what I imagine myself to be. To know this is forgiveness. Even the tide shadows its own retraction, lifting its marrowed hem. The drag of surf keep, keeps drifting. 
We have no more genes than a puffer fish, spotted green among kelp, inflating itself in fear. See how we live with contradictions. Collect them like these perfect broken shells tossed to shore. The world is caught in its churning. Here, tracks of turns disappear like faint marks left on a lover's neck when sorrow unbuttoned its blouse. And permanence, like a bird in flight, circles around us. Only the sun in blind delirium belts out its one pure note. I'm towing a two-step with a ghost crab who's chasing whom as he skitters across the sand, waving his white claws. Thank you. I also have to do a shout out to my, um, to my best editor, my husband Peter, sitting in the back, who's here with his mother, my mother-in-law, Martha Wallace. So, the first poet who's gonna read for us um, tonight is truly one of the most charming and self-effacing guys I think um, I've ever met. Um, his book, The Gun My Sister Killed Herself With, was published by Salmon Poetry in 2018. And the poems appear in, his poems appear in American Journal of Poetry, The Common, Field, Plowshares, Prairie Schooner, and many other journals. The book is poignant, it's tough, it's beautiful, the language is so well crafted. He is a 2018 2019, recip 2019 recipient of a shifting foundation grant and the founder and editor of Plume, a journal of contemporary poetry, Plume Editions, and the annual Plume Poetry Anthologies, which if you're not familiar with that anthology, you need to be, it's terrific. And one of the best things about it, um, the introductions that he writes for them. Um, you have to read them because um, they really give you a sense for how smart this guy is. Um, so, so please do a warm welcome for Danny Lawless. Thank you, Helen, and uh, the Dali. Um, so the poems I'm going to read, oh, here's the anthology. If you are so inclined, you can buy that somewhere. Um, the book I'm going to read from tonight is The Gun My Sister Killed Herself With. Um, obviously, beach reading, yes. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it is rather dark uh, on occasion, but I'll try to skip over a lot of the dark pieces, at least, and not uh, depress you too much this evening. Um, and I tried to, I was just talking with Jay, I'll try to s stay away from the long narrative pieces, which are really hard to follow when you're listening to poetry and not reading it. So I'll read a number of short ones, and if they are a couple of longer ones, but they're not narrative, they're just generally a series of images and kind of a snarky one to, to close. <laughs> um, but this one, it be, the book begins with a poem called A, um, mm -hmm. and it's about my father's stroke as we get into the sort of uh, unpleasant aspects of the book. Um, and every line begins with A, if that interest you as a game to follow along and figure out which line is which. Uh, and you Francophiles will know that uh, one of the A's is by sound only. So uh, you'll catch that as well. But it's called A and it's about uh, my father's stroke. So A, almost, the therapist would say, almost. Dear Angie, a paid optimist. And so again, she'd slide the pen and paper across the sunroom table the first at first held upside down for a moment or simply dropped or flung aside. The second, the thing mostly just stared at. Again, the pen, the paper. April, May, June, July, months of bitten, broken, a line to probe an ear hole with, a crumpled morsel to be tasted or swallowed until a glow late one afternoon, Angie rushes out to greet us with what looks like a toddler's teepee slashed once in rage incarnate, the letter A as adduced by my father after his third stroke. Also, per Klaus, the king of chimpanzees, in his cage at the Internationale de Paris in 1937, 
held up for the crowd, étonnant, neither of which was ever followed by another letter, let history record, let alone a word. Alone, yes, side by side as I've placed them. They're scanned and printed out facsimiles affixed with thumbtacks to the whitewashed wall above my desk. The silence there, a silence my shadow head leans into, listening, as if someday an answer will emerge from it. Which the more pitiable? Ah, no, the more les deux absents, the more complete. Thank you. And here's a here's a lighter one. I write, tend to write about my childhood for some reason, as miserable as it was. Um, and this one is called Pigeon Toe. It's about a pigeon we found somewhere and named cleverly Pigeon Toe. <laughs> uh, and it's kind of awful, uh, the experience. So we were, children are not often um, empathetic or um, clever or smart. So this one's called Pigeon Toe, it's very short. We found you in our neighbor's old garage. For a week, we took turns stroking your oily feathers, feeding you Dixie loaf, popcorn, whatever. And then our pity wore out. At the show, I was the MC. And now the great pigeon toe, I announced to no one. As Billy took a ray candle and beat on the rafters, so you jump from one to the other. In the middle of the performance, he must have swung a little too fast. You landed with a thud and flapped crazily around in the cinders. That was pretty funny. Then we went to baseball practice. What did Balzac say? Who is to decide which is the grimmer sight, whether hearts or empty skulls? That was our, that was our childhood. Um, and this is another one. Of, it's odd how things come back to you in really desperate moments uh, when you think your life is sailing along and then suddenly it isn't. Well, could I have a glass of water, please? Um, and I'm sure that all of you know this all too well, this feeling. Uh, so I had this little pronouncement and then immediately kind of rocketed back to this moment, very brief moment in childhood. It's called cancer. Cancer, the doctor finally says, and suddenly I'm bolting from the back seat of our fat red car toward a greener circle in the green grass. My father's voice simmer off in the distance behind me. What can I say? I was three. I thought the lily pads would hold me up all the way to the other side. Uh, thank you. So you can, you can see they're going to be really short little things. This is called natural selection. If you, any of you go shopping, uh, I just noticed it's not too long ago, when you go in the frozen food section, how one section lights up now, you know, as you pass. And it made me think of Darwin, really awful. Compares, I don't know how that works. Uh, but it's called natural selection. So it says, all these are really short. Uh, in the frozen food section, each section lights up as I pass. Blueberry mini muffins, Stout Piorgis, little pouches of mauve fondant. Like hearing one bird call at a time, all the vanished species of the earth rising up out of the ice again to sing into the clear, untouchable air. Darkness behind, darkness ahead. Mm -hmm. And uh, an another short one. Uh, this is actually fitting with the theme of things aren't what they seem. This poem is kind of that. I, I grew up, any Catholics here? Any lapsed Catholics? So, <laughs> yeah. so you'll remember what the pattern is. You remember the pattern by any chance? Yeah. So if you're an altar boy, and there used to be communion, they would come down, there was a rail, and people would kneel, and you, uh, the priest would deposit the Eucharist into the uh, person's mouth or on her tongue or his or her tongue and you held this little plate under their chin so that if the crumbs of the Eucharist uh, would fall onto the patent and not be desecrated onto the floor. So I thought this poem was going to be about 
being an author boy and doing this. Uh, but then right at the end, it took a sharp sort of turn, and it turned out to be a, a, a poem about a transsexual friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> These things happen. So it's called Andronitis. And do you remember that New Yorker? Uh, there was always they were always coining new words for for emotions and things, and they would have a new word. This one's called Andronitis, and Andronitis is the process of slowly getting to know yourself, which seemed to be uh, kind of right for this poem. So it's for uh, Stephen slash Stephanie. So it should be named right. So a patent, uh, Antonitis, a polished bronze plate with a dark mahogany handle meant to catch the tiniest crumbs of the body of Christ, the patent. Below the scuffed marble com communion rail, above long rows of mouths gaped, candlelight struck their gold fillings. Oh, parched tongues, oh, clearasil and earwax, quivering chin hairs. Sometimes for a joke, you jabbed your friends in the neck with it. <laughs> friends that are dead now. And once in the dim sacristy, you admired your face there as in a golden mirror, pooched your boy lips like this and felt at last like a girl. No one saw, not even God. Mm. 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 And uh, this one is the centerpiece of the poem and the title of the poem of the book. It's called The Gun My Sister Killed Herself With. Uh, it somehow became really popular online. For some reason, must have struck a chord with uh, suicides or something. Uh, and you, the only thing I would tell you is to, you know the poet Rilke, right? So there's a line referring to him at the end. So the gun my sister killed herself with, and it's in the form of the reporter's questions. Sometimes it's an easy structure, who, what, when, why, sort of thing. The gun my sister killed herself with was a cubit long and weighed half as much as an average newborn U.S. baby. Who sold it to her remains a matter of police conjecture. A collector, most likely, or a friend in need of cash, no receipts ever surfaced. What she did between the time she got it and the act adds little to the picture. Coffee at McDonald's, a few words exchanged with a balding man in an army cap outside the 7-Eleven on Broadway. No phone calls, no letter. When my mother got the news, she was hanging sheets to dry in the backyard clothesline. Neighbors heard her cry two blocks over and thought a cat had died. Where exactly father spent that afternoon, CF conjecture. How Irish pretty she was, pale, petite, kind, smart, and slyly funny, or duly noted now on her birthday, in photographs and little tales that end in tears, that end in silence. We, the cage, and Rilke's panther pacing there. A thousand bars, and beyond the bars, no world but why. Terribly sad. Very sad. Uh, this one, um, I'm trying to keep them short here. This one is called Ant and retains the Catholic theme. Um, it's not somebody's Aunt Martha, but it in fact is the insect. And, um, but it is, there is a Catholic thing going on, you'll see at the end here. Um, I don't think there's anything else to know. Ant, I confess it was I who stole a bag of hosts after serving eight o'clock mass and ate them for breakfast <laughs> with a bottle of chocolate milk behind the dentist's office. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Who in eighth grade got a blow job from Angela in the choir loft one stormy spring afternoon while the faces of your fiery prophets darkened with rage. I who stole 20 tabs of hydrocodone from grandma when she had all her teeth pulled. 
not to mention her car, which I wrecked and left somewhere in Tampa. I who so many things. Yet still you find me, Lord, this fine October morning, head bowed before the sports pages. You, who the author of my most intimate desires, were ringing your bell as if I were a child at recess. And sending, I see, your most esteemed black-robed emissary to fetch me. A little ant come to greet me. Uh, yeah. uh, a couple of more. Oh, there, in the book, there are a couple of gorilla poems. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> fascinated with gorillas, I guess. And um, I lived in Chicago for a while. And so this, uh, some, of, some poems are purely imaginative. And some, you, Jay, you just want to transcribe. Really, something happens, and you just rush them and pretty much write what happened. That's one of these. Uh, this one's called The Dean Has No Comment. Uh, <laughs> and it really is about, uh, you know how animals, how we love our animals and how much we think we know that they love us and they're talking, you know, and particularly dogs, not so much cats. Um, but often we are brought up short when we find that's not the case at all, that they are utterly indifferent to us. Um, and so this is about that, it turned out. I didn't know it at the time. But uh, it's called The Dean Has No Comment. Seven, maybe eight years old, nude, and out of nowhere, there she was, streaked from the waist down in glistening pebbled green shit, shivering as she ate a tube of cherry clip lip gloss in the great ape house at the Lincoln Park Zoo. My wife was the first to see her, her hand flying to her mouth. A man in overalls, a boy in a Nike tracksuit, two women wearing Amish bonnets, then the floodgates, a pack of Boy Scouts trailing what looked like plastic swords, half a dozen Hasidic Jews. No one touched her. She might have been surrounded by some sort of forest field. We all just stood there, each new arrival stunned, speechless, so many hands flying to so many mouths, you'd think there'd be, be a word for it, the emotion. For example, litost, which Kundera describes as a state of paralyzing torment created by the sudden sight of one's own misery. Something like that. Even Otto, the dean of lowland gorillas, 24 and having been a resident there since birth, according to the brochure, stopped scratching himself and looked out through the bars with those brooding brown black eyes gorillas have. His hand too, his paw starting to rise upwards as if, but then a mighty yawn. <laughs> Uh, and I'll read just a couple more and have Jay take over the program much better here. This one's called The Old Masters, uh, and it is um, kind of a hymn or elegy, I suppose you could take your pick, for, to married love. Uh, and it, uh, my wife and I have been married for a long time, and things aren't quite what they were. Things change, let's say. Things change. So this is called The Old Masters. Sometime late last night, after polishing off two bottles of Millisemi 2004 to mark our 25th anniversary, and consequently finding ourselves dazed in bed face to face, eyelids drooping with both reading lamps blazing, almost but not quite unconscious, I wanted to exclaim, as I once did, something seriously corny, like, you are my queen or at least flatteringly stun you by reprising almost verbatim our first giddy grad school interrogation of Foucault's position on causal priority vis-a-vis -vis madness over rusty nails at Cafe Dog. Made me dial up the time I was sick and you sent me hand-pressed letters quoting Issa in the hospital, but it wasn't happening. And I got the sense you wanted to do the same. Salute my flagging cock with an aspiring new pet name like 
le chevalier, <laughs> or insist as you strategically maneuvered your fingertips across my expanding forehead, I still look like Bowie in his pre-Ziggy days. <laughs> but that wasn't happening either. Instead, what came out as far as I can remember was mostly just exhausted nonsense. Bucket something something, vestibule something something. As if each word weighed 20 pounds, hard to get a grip on. Like heaving watermelons to a cute stranger over the side of a truck. <laughs> as we once did, broke and grunting one morning outside Davenport. Iowa. Or no, like playing chess, oh love, has it come to this on one of those giant chess sets at the mall? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so uh, two more, and then Jay uh, takes the stage, and you'll be pleased about that. This one's called. Um, Velda the Seer, and it, it turned out to be, again, you start something and it turns out to be something else. Uh, this one's about domestic violence, which I wouldn't have thought I'd be writing about, but there you are. Uh, Velda the Seer, this one's called. Velda the Seer, we all have a little fortune teller in us, she would say years <laughs> later, recalling the day Mick, my sister's wounded punk gearhead boyfriend in the 70s, vamooshed for good again, hauling ass, killing joke, blaring down Eleanor in his Camaro straight pipe. Touching my own cheek as she says this, as if she can see the red palm slap there, courtesy of Raymond, sweet, sweatery, sexagenarian Raymond. The red palm slap and the bruise that bloom beneath the bruise and the one beneath that one. <laughs> and so uh, uh, I think the last one, there's a little short one after this, we'll see, and then um, this one's called Poem with Horse and R.B. R.B. being Robert Bly, as you'll find out again. Uh, but I was telling Jay, as the editor of this anthology in the online journal, I read a lot of poetry, a lot, way too much probably. This is from the submissions list. And I, I noticed over the years that poems uh, employ repetitively certain words and phrases and sub, you've, you're nodding, you've seen this, yes? Even if you read a lot of poetry, naturally you see the same sorts of things. And so this is kind of the snarky poem about, uh, you know, kind of, an, it gets annoying after a while. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, this is addressed to those poets. Like, think of something new or something. Yeah. This is the poem when no one drowns in summer or propranenol, gyres or sluices or falls in love with Sister Wendy. No one pisses off a dock. No one is pixelated. No one wakes this morning believing her life is like the reassembled pieces of a torn up letter nothing clots or tethers. This is the poem where no one fingers a violent scar on the back of a cowboy's neck, no one pleasures herself in the rank nest of her father's deer stand. <laughs> I mean, I just pulled these right from the poems, I'm telling you. <laughs> nothing is pale, nothing shattered or bedizened. This is the poem that does not collage, appropriate, ventriloquize Frank O'Hara or Hala, that does not try to squeeze into the skinny jeans of erasures or pantoons. <laughs> this is the poem from which the ornate nomenclature of ornithology mineralogy, cytomorphology, and all the other ologies is absent, together with the word absent, in which nothing scuds, there are no tusks, and sex is not like anything, 
except perhaps a brief shriek down a forever recycling water slide. This is the poem that does not keep the passing of pass. That's, I'm sorry. This is the poem that does not keen the passing of passenger trains or Mr. Furman, my fifth grade teacher. This is the poem without scent, without footsteps. In other words, this is the poem that closes the door and locks itself in behind it. No castanets, no pie, no dachau or luminescent, no hickeys or sweet Jesus, no animals whatsoever. Well, maybe one. Because how strange, how cynical and impoverished would a poem have to be to refuse admittance to a horse? <laughs> <laughs> and while we're at it, while he's still around, say good old Robert Bly to see it with such clear eyes, the white flake of snow that has just fallen on his mane. <laughs> <laughs> so not that dark. <laughs> that was a great snarky poem. <laughs> We're going to take um, Q and A after Jay has also read. So you can be thinking about your questions for. For Danny, remember them, and uh, and then after the second reading, we'll, we'll do that. That was terrific. Thank you so much, Danny, for that good reading. It's good to get him out here. I had to really prod him to. <laughs> um. Okay, we have Jay Hopler next, and you know what? I I'm betting we have a lot of Jays either current or former students. How many? Raise your hands. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, glad you guys are here. Um, I heard from several who said, can't miss Jay. Got it. <laughs> um, Jay Hopper was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico. <laughs> Timely, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, he, and he earned a BA from New York University and an MA from the Johns Hopkins University Writing Seminars, an MFA from the Iowa Writers' Workshop, no sloucher there, um, and, uh, and a PhD from Purdue. He's a recipient of numerous honors and awards, including a fellowship from the Lanann Foundation, a Whiting Award, and the Rome Prize in Literature. His first collection of poetry, Green Squall, uh, won all kinds of prizes, a Yale Younger Poets Prize, super hard to get, um, a Great Lakes Colleges Association New York Writers Award, a National Best Books Award from USA Book News, a Florida Book Award, etc. His second collection, The Abridged History of Rainfall, which was published in 2016, was a finalist for the 2016 National Book Award in Poetry, which pretty much speaks for itself, right? In his evocative and elegiac poems, Hopper often draws on the tropical landscapes of Florida. He's a professor of English at um, USF in Tampa. So please, a warm welcome for Jay Hopper. So glad to have him here. everybody. It is so good to be here. Um, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not going to uh, lighten the mood any. <laughs> um, which is really funny. I'm, I'm a pretty happy guy in my life, just not on paper. So tonight I'm going to be reading uh, from the abridged history of rainfall for a bit, uh, and then some poems from the book that I'm currently working on called The Crab. Um, the abridged history of rainfall was called The Alligator for like seven years, so uh, The Crab it'll be until it's like my red balloon or something. Uh, but before I do, I need to kind of clear my throat. Um, and I'm, I was never going to read this poem in front of people, but uh, what the hell. Um, and this is in this new anthology that Danny has produced. You guys all need to get one, get a copy of this. It's, it's really one of the best anthologies that uh, gets, gets done every year. Um, I can find it. It's quite large, this anthology. Oh, there it is. Um, so on November the 6th, 2016, 
something happened. Um, and on November 7th, 2016, I got a call from an editor that said, something happened. You need to write a poem about it. So I thought, all right, what the hell. So this is, my, um, this is the poem that I wrote after the election. And I was never going to read it because, well, you can imagine. But we're in an art gallery at a poetry reading, so I'm pretty sure it's safe. <laughs> um, uh, it is called, Some Lights Go Out. Bolt struck steers, we stood and stared into those spaces in between our faces in the TV screen and waited for the floorward drag of gravity on our dumb meat weight. It did not come. Stuck in upright, stunned we stayed, gobs spittle slicked and slack until that screen went black. Have we lost power? I'll say. And we in darkness found ourselves wound woozy to the point of swoon. The world is a shambles, blood and moan. All that here was good is gone. Our knockers a buffoon. We've all been to the kill floor, swoggled by the horns. Thank you for that. That's a poem I never wanted to write. Um, there are many poems that you'll hear me read tonight that I never wanted to write. Um, but uh, now we'll get into the, the poems here. This, these are from the abridged history of rainfall. It was an elegy for my father who died in 2009. Um, winter night full of stars. I am a winter night full of stars. I am that star, the one you thought was a plane. I am the shadow of that plane casting its blackness over the lake house like a shroud. And I am that shroud, black, embroidered with stars under which you grew cold that January night laid out upon your catafalque of down. And those feathers were as snow in that mortuary air floated like snowflakes in that mortuary air when the wind came up and when the wind died down they were as snow upon the ground am i the smoke drifting through the bare branches of a japanese maple or am i the japanese maple smoke drifting through its bare branches it is not smoke but light burning to a fine ash and in that darkness, may you, like those dark blooms, shine. Come, oh, let us to dust together. So I was lucky enough to spend a year in Rome. And uh, the first thing I noticed when I was in Rome was that everyone's gorgeous. And... Uh, um, and so my wife, who did not accompany me, uh, was, was back home, and I called, and I said, I wrote this poem. I can I read it to you? And I did, and then there was this silence <laughs> afterwards. Um, it, the poem is called, Oh, the Sadness Immaculate. <laughs> the women in Rome are so beautiful. It's like being beaten to death in slow motion looking at them. It's like bleeding. So I don't look at them. I look at the parakeets nesting in the blood orange trees, the moon rising behind some ancient something or other, first few stars. From my window, I can see the house where Galileo invented the telescope. I wonder what he was thinking that night, that night he first searched heaven. I wonder what it was he was trying not to see. My wife, we're still married, so that's good. <laughs> Milos once said uh, that when a poet was born into a family, the family is dead. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, 
Um, so there was uh, this, well, <laughs> to say there was this church about Italy is like saying there was this dust moat. But um, <laughs> there was one in particular that I fell in love with in Piazza Navona. And I would go there every night at sunset, and I would watch the, the sunlight um, come through these windows and splash across all the marble. Um, and there was one night in particular that uh, took my breath away. So I ran back to my room and, um, and wrote this poem. The, the form was invented by, I think, Donald Justice. So I just appropriated that. It is called, A Moral Victory is Still a Defeat. It was the 21st of January, and in Sant'Agnese in Agone, the light was not quite right. So late in January, it should have been a watery amber dripping through those high dome windows. Instead, it was a smoldered orange, almost embered, and it rose from the floor in front of the altar, a kind of shimmer that made of Judy's holy family an inferior mirage. That rose someone left on the floor in front of the altar. Was that where the light was coming from? Was it coming from those candles burning on the altar? No. It was from the shrine that light came shining, from the skull of the saint herself. How dismal the winter that year. Rome steeped in a weak tea light, and as though the world were trapped in amber. Oh, Agnes, it was. It was trapped in amber. A sorry world. Um, this is a, a poem. If, I, I brought some books to sell tonight. If you buy them, you will get the paperback uh, version of them, uh, which is, um, I mentioned, only because some of the titles and things are different. So... Uh, the, the one in the, in the hereback version is the original title. This is the one my editor and I argued about for several weeks, and then I just gave up. Um, <laughs> so in this version, it's May 25th. Uh, that is not when my father died, um, which is why we changed it back to the other one. So May 25th or Memorial Day, depending upon your edition. <laughs> Behind the banyan trees, the mansions. Behind the mansions the lagoon, in the lagoon, a mooring of sailboats. Wind in the rigging, hull slap and groan. Where is everybody? The sound of people playing in their pools, well, there isn't any. The streets are empty, and the moon, like a moon jelly, beating its slow float in the not quite dark. In the gardens of the Moorings Country Club, the lights have come on, rice paper lanterns printed with cherry blossoms. Oh, this unstarred sky, and the smell of the star jasmine, the fleshy, resplendent scent of the gardenia. Is this where I say, I miss you? Where I say, Father, isn't there anything in this evening's long cortege of bloom as beautiful as it used to be? Like the sound of an empty ship drifting through fog, like a sweet, despicable imitation of mourning, a piteousness of doves is cooing in the banyan trees. My father uh, was a Navy vet, and so he is buried in the, the National Cemetery in Sarasota. And my, so when my sister and I took his remains there, um, we were asked by a very, very serious looking man if if my father had any sayings that he would like on his tombstone. And my sister and I looked at each other and just burst out laughing because my father had tons of sayings, none of them you put on a tombstone. <laughs> um, and I still think how wonderful it would have been if I had, you know, if I had said, yes, he did, he had one. Could you please put scratch your ass and get glad on his, <laughs> on his tombstone? That would have been wonderful. <laughs> so we said, no, loving father is good. That will do it. <laughs> um, so the next poem I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read to you is a bit on the longer side, but it's in fragments, um, since my attention span is not the attention span one needs to write an epic. So I just write an epic in installments, I guess. <laughs> um, so they're not numbered. I'll just pause meaningfully in between them. Um, there are 
three that are translations that I've done of German. And they're just parts of German poems that I like. So I would pick them out and I would translate a few lines and then put them in. And you'll know when that happens because they're called after the German. So this poem is in, uh, it's called uh, Excerpts from the Unabridged History of Rainfall. In dark rain and sharp rain, in this rain sharpened dark, in this dark sharpened by the sound of rain falling on the roof of the hospital, in blessed rain, in godless rain, in rain that lays its gray weight on the grass, in rain that passes through the branches of the aspen and the mountain ash. And of this drip-lit river makes a testament to heaven's lack of light. Your doctor with his every room, a shadeless chandelierium, what is this dark but light unlamped to him? In the photograph, my father is running down Miami Beach his feet kicking up fans of sand between the splayed legs of live, smiling University of Miami cheerleaders. The year is 1947. God has once again cast Satan from his heaven, and it is safe to turn one's face unto the sun. The palm fronds by sea breezes bent are black against the thunder-headed sky. The hull of every sailboat is white. At the edge of the beach, an empty bench. Birds. After the German one. From the hedgerow, the call of the plover, as plaintive as it is strong. You think of St. Jerome. There is in this one voice such an intense loneliness, only a downpour could answer it. Forget about your bones. This wet gets in the soul, the spirit, whatever you want to call it, that pilot light we're all so proud of, and makes you wish its sad, dim flame would just hiss out. The waterlogged fawns of the tin palms dripping, the gate swinging sodden on its hinge. After the German, too. Nothing will there be but rain. No roof and no dam will protect me from it. On the paths will be trampled springs green to muck. The gray sky collapsing like a lung. The thunder down its heavy leather lays and from the ruined garden by the lake a hazy murmuration lifts into the rain-lit air blurs into the mists that swirl there, then settles in thin wings, swept breaths back into the maiden hair. After the German three. In the hospital, the suffering howl. The night's bluish plumage buzzes. The rain glittering thunders down upon the roofs. The street lights have come on. Soon it will be dark enough to see them. Today it rained so hard, Father. You could hear it, life's shortness of breath. The Grove. Like unborn sons in bunches hung from branches bent by years spent holding up such pulp plump fruit, gorgeous and corpulent, their green rinds tight and shining, sheened with rain. The season's first blood oranges are on the trees. How beautiful they would look against a blue sky. How weary they look against this black one. To be born tired, and to live tired, and to die tired, to die of tiredness, not as hard to imagine as it used to be. Was there ever a sky this low? No, and still there's not. It's just a flock of blackbirds shrouding out above the trees. The moon is up there, 
somewhere in the stars. I'll just read a couple more from this book, and then I will launch into the next. The Coast Road. Um, so I was in Louise Glick's kitchen, and she, was, she had a wasp's nest outside of her kitchen window, and she had hired some people to kill it, to knock it down and everything. So we were just standing there in complete silence watching a stranger kill wasps. And I, and I said, you know, uh, the, a wasp's nest, the real name for that is Vespiary. And she said, that's something. <laughs> <laughs> you should put that in a poem. So, so I promised her that whenever I read the poem, I would make sure that you all understood this is Louise Glick's wasp's nest. The Coast Road. On nights like these, when the house is too quiet, I walk into the moonlit yard and listen. When the wind in the oak tree says, nothing ever happens when you want it to, the crickets in the witch grass say there will never be an end to this droning of the surf, no end to this drowning of the surfer, the tired tread of traffic in the distance. It's not what one listens to that matters, but what one listens for. From the rafters of the back porch, the remnants of a vespiary are hanging, its gray walls stripped thin by poison and last night's rain. A bird takes flight. The moon ignites, the evening weeps, its traffic lights. Isn't there a bird somewhere whose call sounds like, I'm sorry? I'm sorry. What silence is there deep enough to follow a cry like that? OK. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Unexpected. Um, OK, so the next book is a real downer. So um, before I launch into that, I'm going to do uh, one fun poem from uh, the abridged history of rainfall. So I never ask my students to do anything that I can't do myself. Um, uh, so I, and I wanted to assign them a found poem several years ago, and I had never done one. So I figured it's time I should do one. Um, so I found a book called The Ranges of Birds. It's a birding book from the 80s. And this guy, Roger Tory Peterson, um, went to great pains to phonetically transcribe every bird call he heard. And so as soon as I found that out, I thought, it's writing itself. It's, it's great. I'll just <laughs> put on some law and order and, and do a poem. Um, so this is my found poem. It needs to be performed. Uh, feel free to laugh, because I will look like an idiot uh, while I do this. It is called The Ranges of Birds. A simple, spiritless, purwee or chewy. A staccato, tuck -a or cut -a cut also a single cuke. A piercing weep or cleep. A loud pick, pick, pick. A low nasal work. Also tick, tick, tick. A horse carwit, carwit. When flushed, a cackle. A cackling cor e e e a, cor e e e a. An emphatic sneezy bark, kiao or wow or whoa. An asthmatic squeal, Keer, slurring downward. A slightly Phoebe like p -p -p pitzy or pitzy. A croaking crack or crack. A metallic tuck. A harsh fear. A whistled woo wee. A musical too. Also a rattle and a whistle, ticky tick too. A throaty, rasping za za za. Also, kwek, kwek. A nasal wide awake or wacky whack. A loud, whistled weep. Also, a rolling brit. So there was that. <laughs> Sometimes poems just have to be fun. All right. So now, the next book called The Crab. Um, all right, so um, things 
are not what they seem. This will fit perfectly. So a year ago, on July 12, 2017, at exactly 6.25 p.m., um, I was diagnosed with terminal cancer and given two years to live. So um, I did whatever a poet uh, would do, I think. I went home and got to work. Um, I was told that I would have about 12 months before the pain got to the point where I'd have to go into hospice, um, which I would actually, I was scheduled to go in right about now. As you can see, I'm not, so that's good. Um, uh, shortly after the diagnosis, the doctor called and said, hey, since you're dead, um, we have a funky new treatment. What do you say we try it out? And I was like, great, whatever. So um, it worked, and that's, that's awesome. Thanks. Um, so the doctor's office, this was in Utah, and uh, while he was telling me about what to expect from hospice and, and my end of life care and getting my affairs in order, I happened to daydream. <laughs> this is like whatever. I looked out at this beautiful window, and there's this gorgeous mountain with grass on it, and then this, this poem happened. So um, it is called Benediction. The wind in swells through the wild rye rolls. The bright sky dulls. Over the hills, their green backs ringed with bluebells, sunset rung, flaps a wingy shadow westward. A jay, poor bird that no net met nor gin it didn't love. Good luck, you luckless scrub you, you dumb you doomed sucker. God bless. Um, so I, uh, during the treatments, I would you know, take my kids to soccer matches and whatnot um, and wait for them, because life does not stop even when yours does, <laughs> uh, as it happens. Um, so this is called Sonatina on My Cancer. The toilets in the Bennett L. and Rosewood Park men's room are metal and ring like bells when you piss in them. <laughs> ring like rang no bell on the day I was born. Ring like no bell will ring on the day I die. Over the soccer fields roll the shadows of clouds. In the piss-told bowl, a little billow of blood. So I spent most of um, last year in the um, Huntsman Cancer Center, specifically Radiation Vault 4, with three lovely women um, who required me to be almost nearly naked and to pretend that I was dead <laughs> while they moved me in front of this big, like, ray machine. Um, and my, my youngest son and I were, I was taking him through all the sci-fi, all the classic sci-fi movies, and I was reminded of The Fly. And I thought, I really hope there's something in here with me, because I need to be a superhero. Um, so this was, this was composed when I was lying pretty much naked in front of a bunch of strangers looking at the ceiling. It's really amazing how, how you get used to being naked in front of strangers. It's odd. Radiation Vault 4. Oh, let there be in here with me a moth whose DNA with mine will mix when they flip the switch and the room goes nuclear. That I may some days later sprout a pair of wings that'll wing their sun-struck span in a sky-wide, oil-slick rainbow. And may the skull upon its thorax be the skull upon my back, that heaven may upon that aspect cast its homicidal eye when I flutter its porch light to the sun and think its work already done. And now I'll just do, um, I'll just do two more. Uh, to the pair of morning doves that just landed in the tree outside my window at the Huntsman Cancer Institute. You're early. My funeral isn't for a few months yet. If they give me a funeral, which I hope they do not, I hope they set me on fire and sow my sorry ash 
into a cloud. I hope they blow me out of a clown cannon, sling me from a trebuchet. Whatever happens, my wick will burn as if by glories lit, and I will light the sky. And when I do, you better make with the plaintive, you fatted, fatted tragedy junkies. You better cry until you break. And the last poem is um, for my service dog. So when you're dying, you get a service dog. It's great. Um, and so it's funny. It's, <laughs> I'm not sure what this says about. Actually, I know what this is about exactly. So they, they interview you to get your personality type. So I guess they can match you with a breed. And, uh, and I ended up with an English bulldog <laughs> named Penelope. Um, <laughs> And she was so, um, I loved, oh, I love her so much. I loved her so much. Um, she didn't like anyone but me, and it was perfect. Um, and, and she was supposed to be the dog that was going to keep me calm as I passed away. Um, so uh, when the cancer got beaten back, they were like, you don't qualify for a service dog anymore. So I know, right? It's like, cut me a break. But, but so I, ha I had to give her back. After, after a year of this dog like getting me through radiation and surgeries and chemotherapy, I had to give her up. And I gotta tell you, uh, that day when I had to put that dog in the car in my, in my driveway, it was, it was worse than being diagnosed with cancer. I was, it, it was like, I was sobbing, oh my gosh. Anyway, she's now actually been assigned to a, an autistic boy. Um, and uh, she loves him and she follows him into the shower because he's scared of water. So she will sit in the shower while he takes a shower. And I wonder because I had to bathe her once a week and she would just go limp. And I was like, what? You go in the shower for him, but you don't look like him. That's, that's weird. Anyway, uh, thank you all for coming tonight. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks to Danny and Helen, two of my favorite people. It's been such a, an honor to read for them and with them. Um, so this poem is called, Today's Disaster is Tomorrow's Regrettable Event. <laughs> no longer dying, no need of a service animal. The dog packed off back where she came from, and me grieving over it. Bereft, a word I've never used, is a word I've used two times since Tuesday, and it's only Wednesday at 3.16 a.m. The doctors may extend your life, but you will pay for every extra second of it. Free don't live here. I live here to my amazement. Thank you so much. <laughs>